Here we go. Amen. Praise the Lord and good evening, everyone. Praise the Lord and good evening, everyone. We greet you in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we are grateful to God to be with you tonight for our weekly Bible study and prayer. We want to jump right into it. So let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for watching over us this day, even as we turn our plates down to draw closer to you. We thank you, Lord, that in the midst of our busy days and our hectic schedules, that you speak a word to our hearts. Your word penetrates the darkness. Your voice penetrates the noise. And you reach us in the depths of our soul. Speak to us even now, Father, as we posture ourselves to receive from you with our hearts lifted and the spirit of expectation. We know that there is something that you have for us tonight. So bless, Lord God, those that are here now, those that will hear this recording. Allow their lives to be touched, their faith to be strengthened, their love and their commitment to be made deeper. I pray that somebody that may not have the Holy Spirit, Lord, that is outside of the ark of safety tonight, listening, but that your word will draw them in as you drew us with your loving kindness. So do it for them. Somebody needs something to be done for them, Lord God, and I believe right now and I declare it shall be done. It shall be done. It shall be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord again, everyone. Bless your hearts. Um, we're so very excited to be with you tonight. I'm going to ask that you would take a moment to share the lesson tonight on your um, social media page. Those of you that are on Facebook, that are watching right now, we're going to ask that you take a second, take a, well, take a few seconds to share this out. Um, welcome to Bible study and prayer with Eula Tabernacle. Amen. Praise the Lord. And certainly it's a great big welcome tonight. Um, the Lord has given us a word and we want to jump right into it. Um, it's important that you take a moment, though, as we consider our theme for this year being focus. It's very important that you understand the basis of this. And so um, our theme scripture is out of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter six, and the book of Ephesians, chapter one. Last week, we shared with you the reminder of focus out of the text from Matthew. This week, I want to share with you the reminder of focus from the text of the book of Ephesians. And so I'm going to read this to you tonight. Um, there's going to be a lot of reading. So believe you me, you'll have an opportunity to, to read. But I want you to take notes. I want you to open up your Bibles. I want you to have pen and paper handy. I don't want you to leave um, to memory, recalling the things that will be shared tonight and the insight that will be given. I want you to make a note of it so that you can refer back to it in the future. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse number 15, it says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. This is the Apostle Paul writing this letter. It's a prison epistle. In other words, it was a letter or an epistle written to the church at Ephesus while Paul was in prison in Rome. This was one of four letters that he wrote from prison, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. It was to those four congregations that the Apostle Paul wrote these four individual letters. And so we'll continue, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that she may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, to us word who believe according to the power, to the working of his mighty power, which worketh, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, 
but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Beloved, I want you to understand as the apostle Paul was sharing this letter, writing it to this beloved congregation, he's praying for them. He's making mention of them in his prayers. He doesn't stop praying for them. As a good shepherd, he keeps them before God. He keeps their needs before God. He keeps their growth before God. He keeps their relationship and the, the, the soundness of their walk. These are prayer elements that the Apostle Paul articulates in this letter. He expounds on this letter. And what he's praying is that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of our Lord. Now, this is so important because focus, the focus is on the things of God. And the Apostle Paul is praying that their eyes would be open to look beyond the natural, to look beyond the surface, to look beyond the elementary or even the rudimentary. In the book of uh, Hebrews, um, I believe Hebrews chapter six is where he writes concerning his desire for the people, for the Hebrew Christians to go beyond the foundational doctrines unto perfection. And so this is a prayer for spiritual growth and perfection in the Holy Ghost. And he's, he's starting this out by saying, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. And we know that eyes are connected with sight, seeing, being able to perceive, being able to understand, being able to comprehend, even the phrase, the colloquial phrase, or the, 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 um, the figurative phrase, I see, suggests understanding. And so this understanding in the spirit is very powerful. This is transformational. It's not just informational. It's not just inspirational. It's transformational. That the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know, begin to know, know the hope of his calling. Understand and get, with, get in your spirit. Why is it that he has called you? What is the hope? of this calling? What is the exceeding, the riches of his glory in of the inheritance in the saints? There, there's certain, there's something that not only has God put in us, there's something that God is looking to get out of us. He's looking to get something out of us for what he has put into us. This is why that born again experience is crucial. This is a letter written to Christians, to spirit-filled believers to the saints at the church of Ephesus. And it is important for you to understand the necessity of the infilling of the Holy Spirit because all of what is written in the epistles is written to the spirit-filled believer, to the church. And so Paul goes on, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? You know, the hope of his calling the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The richness of what God is looking to get out of us is connected to what he's put into us. And so that speaks of the productivity, what he's looking to get out of us, what he's looking forward to from the work of our hands. Glory to God and the exceeding greatness of his power. That's why those three items have like a little star next to it, because I want to highlight them to you as something for which to focus on. According, and all of this is according to the working of his mighty power in us. So it's the power of God at work. And Paul uses the resurrection of Jesus Christ as an example of where this power was seen, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And so the resurrection is the model, the basis for which the Apostle Paul is encouraging the spirit-filled believer to understand this power of resurrection. The power of the resurrection is the power that works in the believer. It, 
You don't have to wait to get to heaven to experience the power of God, to know the power of God personally, to tap into the power of God. And I feel something right there. Somebody put it in your notes. Tap in, tap in. Focus wants you to lean on flesh. I'm sorry. The devil wants you to lean on the flesh, but focus causes you to tap into the spirit. This is very important, and we're going to get to it in, in, as we go through the lesson. But this is just a reminder. This is kind of like an appetizer um, before we get into the meat of the lesson. And the last point that Paul makes in this foundation scripture in verse 22 and 23, and hath put all things under his feet, that is Christ, and hath gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Let's think about this verse for a moment. If Christ is the head and everything is under his feet, all things are under his feet, and he's the head over all things, and the church is his body, whatever is under his feet is under ours as well. The Apostle Paul wanted the saints of Ephesus to not only discern what God has done in them, what God is looking to produce through them, but he also wants them to see where God has placed them. Glory to God. Position. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right there. The devil doesn't have authority over the church. Christ is the Lord of the church. As a matter of fact, Jesus is Lord of all things. But he is the, the, this text tells us explicitly that he is the head over all things to the church. Anything that affects us in the body of Christ, in the church, Jesus is over that. He's the Lord of it. He is the Lord of everything. And in particular, in this text, the church. Let's get into our lesson tonight. And so as we proceed through the Power 2 series, we've been sharing with you concerning the, the focus, uh, the, the topic or the theme of focus. And we've been del delving into each letter each week. F is for follow, O is for obey, C is for commit, U is for unload, which we dealt with last week. And it was a wonderful lesson of deliverance, a lesson of healing, a lesson of victory. Praise the Lord. Because when you cast your cares upon the Lord, you give him your burden and he gives you his power. You give him your heartache and he gives you his healing. Every broken thing that you give the Lord, God gives you something whole in return. I'm going to say that one more time. For every broken thing you yield to God, the Lord gives you something whole in return. One of the reasons why people are walking in brokenness is because they haven't given it to the Lord. Because whatever you give to the Lord in a broken state, the Lord will heal you from that. He's a healer. Lord have mercy. We, 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 I'm feeling something already. The last lesson in the series is focused or essentially pointing to, as the image there is pointing, to S, which is to stay, stay saved. All of this is based upon our overall series theme scripture, which is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But after that, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Clearly, what the Lord Jesus is telling his disciples is you're not going to have power just to flex your own muscles. This is not about you. Your power is to be a witness, empowered to witness. And the greatest witness that we have to the people in this world is not about gifts of the Spirit. It's not about speaking in tongues. It's about the consistency of our walk with God to show them how it's done. Lord, have mercy. And it's not about us. It's about God working in us. And, and I, I just, I just want to encourage somebody listening to this lesson tonight. Praise the name of God. I feel the Holy Ghost talking to somebody right now. The Lord raises up examples around us of Christians, spiritual believers, to show us how it's done. Jesus was the primary model, and we're to pattern ourselves after him. But uh, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about 
Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run this race with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We run, and there's a state, imagine there's a stadium filled. Glory to God. Glory to God. Most of the times, the people that are in the stadium, are the onlookers, those that are watching from the sidelines. Imagine being in a stadium filled with people cheering you on that have gone through these things, that have endured these tests and trials, that have overcome the wicked one, overcome the tempter, overcome Satan. My God, my God, can you hear the roar of the crowd saying you can make it? My God, my God, let's get into this lesson, staying saved. And so this is the final lesson in the Power 2 lesson series. Again, this is the final one in the lesson, in the Power 2 lesson series. So tonight, the Power 2, stay saved. Okay, so I need some readers uh, to come on board here, um, and you can indicate it in the chat. You know how we do it. Um and you just need to put, in this case, John, Galatians, or Colossians. And you could even abbreviate Galatians and Colossians. But I just need to see, okay, we've got one for Sister Zoe for John. God bless you. Sister Lynette, you can choose something else. Um, I love the fact that we've got this chat in Zoom. Galatians, Missionary Jones has that. I can see exactly who came first. There's no question about it. But I appreciate the enthusiasm. Um, and Sister Sarge for Colossians. All right, so Sister Alexander, you can come in the second round of verses. Let's start with this. What's important, <laughs> bless your heart, <laughs> Corinthians. Okay, well, we do have a Corinthian verse coming up. I don't know how <laughs> you pull that one out of the hat, but we'll come around to you, Sister Alexander, bless your heart. And so when we talk about the power to stay saved, we need to establish the groundwork of this powerful life or this experience of salvation. John chapter eight, um, I believe Sister Zoe um, has that. Um, it's important to recognize what's happening here as the groundwork for the power to stay saved. Let's go into this text and we're gonna explain it as we go through. Sister jo Zoe, um, John chapter eight, Verses 30 through 36, please. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Thank you so much. The Lord Jesus is speaking here to believers and to followers, and he's making a distinction here that's essentially separating those who are passive followers to those who would be committed followers. Everybody that's a follower or a disciple is not the same level. There are some that follow Jesus for the fishes and the loaves, loaves for the things they get from Jesus. That's a non-committed follower. Non-committed followers will be, will be there sometimes, will not be there other times. They'll perhaps come with some level of enthusiasm. Sometimes they'll come with almost no level of enthusiasm. <clears throat> Non-committed followers will get discouraged easy and allow the discouragement to keep them away from following after Jesus. Committed followers will also experience varying degrees of discouragement but they will realize that their consistency with following the Lord is the key to their true discipleship. 
true discipleship goes beyond accolades being laid upon God when awards are received, when great moments of commendation come our way, when we have accomplished something or earned a degree and we're standing on stage receiving some kind of an award or some kind of recognition where we want to give honor to God. That's fine. That's okay. But God wants you to give honor to him when there's no spotlight on you. God wants you to commit and be consistent with him when there's no applaud from a crowd, when the only applause you hear is him smiling on you, him encouraging you with his words, when the only voice you might be able to hear is your voice repeating God's word. My God, my God. Because there'll come a time, even like Jesus, where he couldn't hear, he didn't hear God's voice. He didn't hear. He, he felt abandoned. He felt alone. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? The height of the pain and the, the, the weight of crucifixion crashing down on Jesus, causing him to utter those words. And certainly that was the outcry of his flesh. He that knew no sin became sin for us. The weight of the sins of the world were placed upon Jesus. And he that knew no sin became sin for us. This crashing weight, this immeasurable weight, this unfathomable weight coming down on Jesus, never having experienced anything of this in his entire existence, brought his flesh to the point of crying out. My brothers and sisters, there are times when our flesh will cry out. But I want you to understand that first column with John 8 talks about a promise that you shall be free. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Ye shall be free. This is the promise. But I want to move, I want to move from the promise to the fulfillment because this is where some people get lost. They get stuck in the promise and they never go to the fulfillment. So uh, Sister Missionary Jones has Galatians. And then after that, we're going to go to Sister Sandra. Missionary Jones, please read Galatians chapter 5, verse number 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Ah, uh, come on here now. Amen. John's, the text of the Gospel of John speaks to what is available for those that will become spirit-filled. Galatians speaks to what is a part of the life of the spirit-filled. It's not pointing to something that will come. It's shining the light on something that as, has already come. And so, whereas the gospel message talks about what shall happen in the epistles, and Galatians is one of those epistles, it talks about what has happened, the, the born-again reality, realities, spirit-filled realities, realities that are connected with being filled with the Spirit of God. So not a promise to be had, but a power to be used. Stand fast, therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. This is a thing of the past. The moment you receive salvation, you receive freedom. My God, my God. Can I say that one more time? The moment you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you receive freedom. You can't talk about freedom from an experiential standpoint, not spiritual, supernatural freedom. My God, without the Holy Ghost, you can have moments of intestinal fortitude, um, moments where you have overcome an ill in your life or overcome some vice, but fullness of freedom only comes through Christ. Come on, somebody. The fullness of freedom comes through Jesus. I said the fullness of freedom. Somebody put that in the chat. In the chat. Please put that in the comments. The fullness of freedom only comes through the Holy Ghost. You must be born again. Christ has made us free. Let's go to Colossians chapter one, 
verses 12 through 13. Lord, have mercy. Mm. Glory to God. Colossians, I think that's Sandra. Bless your daughter. Sorry. No Sorry problem. To press unmute. Okay. Colossians chapter one. Good night, everybody. Colossians chapter one, verse 12 through 13 says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Thank you, daughter. What I want you to see are the terms that are used in terms of the tense. The tense, the word tense. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet. Past tense. Made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance in the saint, of the saints in light. Verse 13, who hath delivered us. Again, past tense. Something that has been done for us, done in us, done by God, hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us. Glory to God. Something that's done in the past. It's already done. It hath been done. It hath been done. Not that it shall be done, because the believer has promises to tap into concerning the future. I'm so glad that God's blessings for our lives are not just tied to the present. His promises are also connected to our future. My God, so that I can walk in divine favor, I can walk in divine blessing, I can walk in the word, in the power and the integrity of God's word and know that what he has started in my life will bless me for the rest of my life. Can somebody put that in the chat? What God has started in my life will bless me for the rest of my life. This Holy Ghost power. See, this, this is why staying saved is so crucial because we're not here to get the fluff. You know, it's, it's, this is not about a fluff experience. This is not about candies and cookies and um, you know, uh, sprinkles and flowers and puppy dogs. And no, this, this is about staying power. And what I, what I love about to this particular area tonight is that it talks about staying power. Glory to God. Somebody put down in the chat, if you have the Holy Ghost, I want you to put, I have staying power. I'm not in and out. I may feel discouraged. I may feel fought. I may feel under attack, but that's not changing my staying power because my, yeah, woo, my staying power is connected to Jesus. And, and the songwriter says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I will wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. The Lord hath delivered us. Glory to God. And I need somebody to have enough faith to put that in the comments. I am delivered. You have the Holy Spirit. I need you to, I need you to make a statement. I am delivered. I'm not trying to be delivered. I'm not looking forward to being delivered. I'm delivered right now. I'm delivered. He hath delivered us. He is delivering us now. He's sustaining and keeping us, and he will deliver us. We are delivered, glory to God, from the power of sin in the Holy Ghost. We are delivered, we will be delivered uh, from the presence of sin. Even now, sin, Romans chapter 6, shall have no dominion over us, for we are not under the law but we're under grace. God brought us out. He brought us out of the miry clay. He delivered us from the power of darkness. He, he got me out of it. Hey, hey, glory to God. I feel the testimony right there. He got me out of it. 
he got me out of it. He delivered me from a life of sin, from a past of sin. Even right now, when the enemy comes in like the flood, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard and the Lord will deliver me. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth us. This is what's happening right now. In spite of what I'm going through, the Lord delivers. Glory to God. Hey, he delivered me from the powers of darkness. He delivers me even now in spite of the tribulation and, and, and the, the infirmities, the tribulations, the attacks. He delivers me now, and he will deliver me from the very presence of evil in the rapture. I'm delivered. I'm delivered. Lord have mercy. Let's go on. It's important to understand where God has put you and what God has done for you so that staying saved is based upon the fact that you already are saved. Now, this is important. I want to I want to establish the, the, the importance of what God has done, because I want you to understand God did it. The Lord did it. So we, we got Ephesians and uh, Corinthians. So Sister Alexander, I'm going to let you read that first Corinthians chapter six, verse nine through 11 verse when we get to it. So Sister Alexander, you've got that. And I need a volunteer for Ephesians chapter two, verse eight through 13. Missionary Tinley, God bless you. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight through 13. Again, the this staying power. I want you to understand about this staying power. Let's go. Let's do the reading. I, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you where the power to stay safe is going to come from in a minute. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Praise Missionary Tilly, bless you, dear. Praise the Lord, everyone. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 13. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not that, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliened from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. Let's understand. This work of salvation is a gift of God. Salvation is a gift. You don't have to struggle for it. You don't have to convince God to give you the Holy Ghost. God was convinced from before the foundation of the world when Jesus, in the mind of God, was slain for us all. What happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned was a foreshadow of a sacrifice that was going to be made that would cover mankind. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the Bible says that they recognized that they were naked. The, the glory of the Lord had left them and they saw their humanity. Their humanity was exposed. Prior to that, it was covered by the divinity of the presence of God. Sin caused them to lose the glory and their humanity was exposed. They attempted to cover their flesh with fig leaves, which showed the futility and the vanity of man's attempt to do for themselves what only God could do. Man lost the glory and anything man tries to use as a substitute to cover themselves will only be temporary. Fig leaves die, they dry up. 
but what God did in that garden by slaying an innocent lamb or an innocent animal. Scripture doesn't tell us what animal it was, but it was an animal that provided skin. And that skin was a covering for Adam and Eve. It was the innocent that was slain for the guilty. It was the innocent where blood had to be shed for without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so all of what was going on in that Genesis account provided a prophetic glimpse into the future of what God was going to ultimately do by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for all humanity. Fast forward, God did it. God did it for Adam and Eve in the garden. God did it in the various other types and shadows of the Old Testament. He delivered is, uh, the, the Hebrews out of Egyptian bondage. He delivered his servant Joseph out of the hands of those who sought to kill him. He delivered Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah while they were in an ungodly kingdom, surrounded in an environment of godlessness where there was polytheism, all kinds of compromise, while even in captivity, exiles from Jerusalem, now in Babylon, most of the exiles were subject to failing and compromise. But Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Daniel refused to defile themselves with the king's meat, the mind to stay with God, my God. I, I don't know who, who needs to hear this, but I just want to encourage somebody, refuse to be defiled refuse to be defiled. Salvation is the gift of God. You couldn't do anything to earn it. God gave it to you. God did it. And, he, and, and, and in so doing, you are now his workmanship. You are the evidence of the power of deliverance. Come on, somebody. Your life, this is why staying saved is important. And I'm, we're going to get to the power to stay saved. Our lives are lights in a dark world as a witness that Jesus not only saves, but that he keeps us. We are the, his workmanship created in Christ unto good works. So the work that we do is not to be saved. The works that we do in the kingdom, it's not to earn brownie points with God. The works that we do in the kingdom of God it's not to solidify our position in Christ. That was taken care of. Jesus paid it all. By one offering, hath he forever perfected them that would be sanctified. Jesus did it all. Now it's up to us to shine. My God, put it, put it in the chat. I'm going to shine. <laughs> I'm going to shine. Remember, verse 11. Because staying saved is also connected with remembering where we came from. Remember that there was a time when you were completely out of sorts, disconnected. You might have been in the church building, but you weren't in the church body. And there's a big difference. It's one thing to be in the building. It's another thing to be in the body. And even at the time when, you know, people may have gone to church, they, they like to go to church because of the feeling, they get a good feeling. We don't go to church because we get a good feeling. We go to church because we worship the Lord and we go there to magnify him. Anything else that comes out of that experience of magnifying the law, the Lord, that's gravy to us. We're not there to fill a role. We're not there to perform a job. We're not there to do anything other than to magnify the Lord and to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness in the congregation of the righteous and lift our voices up together. And when the spirit of God moves in, glory to God, whoo, that's God blessing the fellowship. That's God blessing the coming together. That's what we look for. It's not about who can sing the best or preach the best or lead worship the best or play the instruments the best. No, when we come to church, it's not about really trying to bring people. It's trying to lift up the Lord. We want to lift them up. When we lift up the Lord the way we ought to lift them, people are going to come. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw. 
And this drawing is through the lives that we live as lights in the world. But now, verse 13, despite the alienation, despite the estrangement from the things of God, verse 13 says, but now in Christ, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of, of Christ. The blood, as the same way that blood was offered in the garden of, uh, of Eden, blood was offered on the hill of Golgotha. Even in the garden of Gethsemane, when the Lord Jesus was praying, the Bible says that he was praying with such intensity that his perspiration fell from him like drops of blood. Glory to God. Jesus paid it all. He's paid it all. The debt, you don't owe sin anything because Jesus paid the sin debt. And because of it, you are freed from sin. Let's go on to 1 Corinthians real quick. Lord have mercy. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. My, my, my. Good evening, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, dear. I got something really quick, please. Very quick. Um, Bishop Michael, was you, was you with me at church Sunday? I have a reason for saying that because most things you said, it was said Sunday. So it's confirmation for me. Mm. It was said Sunday. I'm serious. The Lord is speaking to me again. Mm. Especially, they kept saying, God did it. And you just wow. said again, God did it. Thank wow. you. Wow. 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 To God be the glory. I get so happy. To I don't God apologize. Thank you, Lord, for your confirmation. The witness of the Holy Spirit is a powerful Thank thing. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. They are the yes. sons of God. Thank you, Lord. That's a witness. That's For those that are listening, that's called the Spirit bearing witness. When someone will say a word that is exactly something that was said a day or even the same day or throughout the week, because the Lord will witness to a person. And the witness is an affirmation and a confirmation. It's like hearing it over and over again. The scripture says in the mouth of two and three or three witnesses, let every word be established. And there are times when the Holy Spirit will prompt a person to say something to someone else or to an audience of people where the witness of the Holy Spirit goes forth. Bless your heart, dear. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sister Alexander. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine through 11. My God, my God. Mm. Mm. Amen. I think you might have, you may have muted yourself or. Sorry. No, no I problem. I got too excited. I, no problem. Come on with I it. I got to say one more thing. I'm sorry. I got to say one more thing. Okay. I meant to put down Colossians, but, I, I, but on my, my phone thing, Second Corinthians, I got to say it. The preacher preached in, in Corinthians. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Lord. My God. My God. My God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. You Thank listen you. to your saints. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is the love of God. Oh. This is the love of God to us. Second so Corinthians chapter 4. <laughs> It was Corinthians. I had no idea. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Father. Yes, yes Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> My God. I'm so there is a joy Lord. that is so overwhelming. Thank you, Lord. That the, the, the cry of the heart is not a cry of sorrow. It is no. overwhelming joy. Thank it is an you, overwhelming Lord. sense of the love, the personal relationship love of god <laughs> my god i understand okay I understand. god's love me. is overwhelming yes ahead, sir please. thank you father yes. thank you mm. okay first mm. corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 through 11 know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters Idolaters. Idolaters. Sorry. No Idolaters. 
no adulterers, no effeminate, no abusers of themselves with mankind, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And says, so for some of you, that's past tense. Thank you, Lord. Another confirmation. Jesus. Speaking to me, speaking to us, Lord, thank you, Lord. And it says, for some of you, be ye washed, be ye sanctified, be ye justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God. All the glory belongs to you, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. It is important to understand, and the Lord, this was the foundation. This is the foundation. This is the foundation. The God did it. The Lord has done it. The Apostle Paul is posturing this presentation in Corinthians. It wasn't a perfect church. Spirit-filled believers, they weren't perfect. They had a lot of problems, a lot of flaws, but they were spirit-filled. And the Apostle Paul chose to highlight here a very important truth. Don't you understand that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? You can be, you can say that you're going to be whatever you want to be and, and the way you're going to live your life. You're going to be, you're going to do you. You can do you all you want. But if you stay in a certain state, you're going to do you in a way that you ain't going to like because you're going to be doing you in, in the lake of fire for all eternity. Don't be deceived. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going nowhere. You're not going to heaven. You're not going into paradise. You're not going into eternity with God. If you are living in sin, you're outside the ark of safety. You must be born again, my brother. You must be born again, my sister. You've got to do it the way God says so. Don't, you know, fornicators, idolaters, uh, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves of mankind, thieves, you know, robbers, covetous, those that are uh, uh, that are driven by lust, inordinate affections, um, drunkards, you know, um, the loss of control of one's senses, inebriated, high, aka high, nor revilers, nor extortioners, you know, people that try to pressure people into doing things through threats. My God, you're not going to get into the kingdom of God. You're not going to get there. No way. You're not going to get there. The Bible says it. This is not Pastor Michael saying it. This is the scripture saying it. You're not going to get there. But Paul then pivots and says, and such were some of us. He doesn't just give this list of people that are not going to get to heaven. He said, y'all used to be the same. Y'all used to be in the same boat. But, glory to God, I love that but. It's a transition word. Ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. What the Lord has done for us has made the difference. Let's move on quickly. The power to stay saved is in submission. It's in the recognition of what God has done, an acknowledgement of the finished work of Christ in your life. Receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, biblical evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God give utterance, your personal Pentecost, my God. That is where it started. Pentecost is where it started, but that's not where it ended. Glory to God. Pentecost was the start. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power. That goes back to our foundational verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, for this lesson series. You got to have the Holy Ghost. But I want you to understand there's more than Pentecost to us. There's more than a Pentecostal celebration. It's a Holy Ghost lifestyle. James, come on. Um, we got James, and then we got two scriptures out of the book of Romans. Um, I'm going to read it just to be expeditious, and then somebody can get ready with Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 12. James chapter 4, 
verse 1 through 8, from whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? You know, the Apostle James is talking about uncontrolled desires. Uncontrolled desires. This is why submission is so important. Ye lust and ye have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. All this in and out, this up and down, this vacillation, um, the inconsistency. In the earlier part of this book, the book of James, which is the New Testament book of wisdom, as a side note, the Lord uh, James writes about um, being double-minded, <clears throat> being driven by the waves and the winds, driven with the winds and tossed. Talks about a double-minded state. It's not just about a moment of being double-minded because there may be some times when you're not sure exactly which way to go. And you think, should I go left? Should I go right? But James is talking about the vice and the problems of living in a state of being double-minded where everything is, oh my God, do I do this? Do I do that? I start going right, then I try to go left. This double-mindedness results in instability. This instability results in uncontrolled desires, insatiable desires, frustration. And this is where James now in chapter four is, is saying this frustration and this inconsistency, this vacillation has reached a height to a point where it's where it, it results in war. There is a there's a there's a battle, there's a lust, there is warfare, there's unsettlement. It says that you you can't even get your prayers answered under that in that state. And he's talking to people that have the Holy Spirit. This is an epistle. You can't even get your prayers answered. You're wondering why your prayers are not answered? It's because you are living in an uncontrolled condition. Glory to God. Even when we're in the storms of life, the Holy Ghost is an anchor for the soul. And we can remain constant. We can remain steadfast. The Apostle Paul would never tell us to do something that uh, under the unction of the Holy Spirit that could not be done. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, around verse 58, when he says, be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, you know, he couldn't say that to us if it was something that we could not attain unto. Or he couldn't say that to us unless it was something that we already had the power to do. James says, you ask, you receive not because you ask amiss. You're all over the place. Even in the prayer, your prayer life is, is unfocused. There goes that word again, focus. It's all over the place, and it has, it has wrong intentions. It has ulterior motives. You're not praying for something in line with God's will. You're praying to consume it upon your own lust. Verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, unfaithful in relationship. See this? Lacking spiritual fidelity, because he's not really talking. I mean, he could be talking to people that are living in adultery. But there's more of a spiritual connotation here because James is basically looking at a holistic life that is out of control. No consistency, no faithfulness, no integrity, adulterers and adulteresses, leaving the commitment of your marriage, breaking your marriage vows, breaking vows. And this is, this is deep, this is very deep because James is saying, when you start breaking your vows to God, all bets are off. When a person can't commit to God, don't think they're going to commit to you. Because the strength to stay committed to you is connected to their commitment to God. When you're looking to marry somebody, watch their lives. Give, give them time to show you what you need to see. As a matter of fact, this is the prayer you need to pray. If you're looking at somebody to marry, don't marry them until you pray this prayer. Lord, show me what I need to see about this person. They may bring gifts. They may bring flowers. They may shower you with, with, with hugs and kisses and give you all these kind of gifts for your birthday, um, for special events. Those things can come and go. Gifts are not what you build a, a commitment on because there may come a time when you can't give a gift. There may come a time 
when there's no gifts to be given. And the commitment has to be real. There can be storms. It can be a season. All of us go through seasons in our lives. And our commitment, our stability, that's a word I just made up. I don't know that that word exists, but I just made it up. Your stability is connected to submission. Commitment. Verse four, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of this world is enmity with God? Your allegiance, your allegiance, who's got your ear? Who, who's got your ear? Who are you listening to? When James talks about friendship with the world, he's talking about allegiance. He's talking about where are you aligned? Are you aligned with God? No matter what the world says about it, no matter what the opinions are of the world, are you faithful to God? This adulterers and adulteresses talks about fidelity, talks about faithfulness and relationship. This staying power is connected to submission. This submission is very important. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? There's a war going on. Your spirit has to submit to the Holy Spirit. And if your spirit is not submitting to the Holy Spirit, there's going to be a battle. There's going to be a battle. Verse six, but he giveth more grace because there's a battle. Glory to God, I feel, there's the breakthrough. Verse six is the breakthrough. In spite of the inevitable battle, when you stay submitted to God, he gives more grace. He gives more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud. This is the unrepentant, the arrogant, the know-it-all, the one resistant to confession, the one resisting to forgiveness. Come on, somebody. The one resisting to change. Resistant to leadership, Lord have mercy. That's proud. They go about proud knowing nothing. He said that the scriptures that God resists them. You don't want God to be in a position where he's resisting you. You want to be in a place where God favors you, not resists you. Resistance from God can come in the form of correction. Because whom the Lord loves, he'll chasten. He will chasten the hard head, the stiff neck, the rebellious. He'll spank you to get you right so you won't get left. Can I say that one more time? The Lord will spank you so you can get right, so you don't get left. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Submission is the key. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and through 9. I may have to do this um, in the interest of time, and I want to share this with you. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 9. For they that are after the flesh, this is where that flesh comes in, and this is talking to people that have the Holy Ghost. If you let your flesh rule you, you're going to, be in a, you're going to have a problem. After those that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They focus on the things of the flesh. The things of the flesh are important to them. How they satisfy their own needs, how they gratify their own wants, how they prioritize their own interests. But they that are after the spirit, they do mind the things of the spirit. They put the things of God first. God comes first. It doesn't mean that you go into this this false humility, um, you know, abusing your body to, to, to show a level of piety and spirituality, taking on a vow of poverty, refusing to, uh, to have money in the bank, refusing a job. You know, some people, they, they talk about a vow of poverty because they don't know how to hold a job. They haven't learned how to hold a job because they don't have the discipline needed to, to, to be consistent with a thing. This one of the worst things that a Christian should, that the Christian, you know, an example of a bad Christian is a Christian with no discipline. A Christian, how can you call yourself a disciple with no discipline? 
because the word dis discipline, discipline is a part of discipleship. Y'all pray with me for a little while. You will pray for me for a long while. You've got to submit. Discipleship is where the Lord is the, is the ruler of your life, where Jesus is the Lord of your life, not where you are partnering and trying to barter with God and trying to fleece God. Lord, if you do this and I'll do that, you know, um, you know, there may be a time in your life where your back is so up against the wall where you say, Lord, if you bring me out of this, I'll, I'll, I'll serve you. I'll give you everything. I'll do it. And, you know, that's a reality. But don't let that be every time you're in something, you know, you, you keep falling and playing games with sin and you're like Israel. One day you're following the Lord. The next day you're not following the Lord. And then you're back and forth in this, this sin cycle. That's the carnal mind. That's the mind that wants to do what it wants to do. And then every now and then it'll, it'll wake up because consequences fall on it. Now, let's understand this. There may be a time when you play that game back and forth and you don't make it back in time because you don't know when Jesus is coming and the Lord will come at a moment that you think not and you will be left behind. So they that are in the flesh, verse eight, you can't please God. That's a place where you can't please God. Verse nine, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. This is where the Holy Ghost is so important. You are not you're in this body, but you're not governed by this body. You're in the flesh, but you're not governed by the flesh. The Holy Spirit is your governor. The Lord is your governor. Verse eight, verse nine rather ends with this sobering word. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You've got to have the Holy Ghost. You, you know, confusion will come to distract you. You may not be the one bringing the confusion, but the enemy is going to use confusion to distract you. And it could be on your job. It could be in your school. It could be in your home. Um, that confusion can come to be a distraction for the saved, for the saint, because the enemy wants to shake you. And this is where your resistance of the devil is the power to overcome the shaking. Hey, hey, I got to go on. Romans 12, one through three. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Actually, Romans chapter 12, verse one and two. And be not conformed to this world, be rather, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Submission. Submit yourself unto God. Present your bodies unto God. That is the submission. And the way you do this is through saying yes, reading the word and finding where God wants you. Being in Bible study and understanding what the word says to you. Being a part of a local congregation, faithfully attending worship so that in the context of fellowship with believers, you can grow and learn what God has for you to do. Growing in God is not done in isolation. Your body doesn't grow in isolation of other parts. <clears throat> Everything about your body is connected. You got hands, arms, elbows, shoulders, you know, torso, thighs, knees, you know, feet. Ankles, toes, fingers, ears, all of these parts work together in the body as a whole. They don't grow independent of the body. They're not living or being sustained independent of the body. Their sustenance is because they're connected. If my arm, if I lose my hand, this hand will die. My body can live, but I'll be without a hand. The hand alone can't live by itself. The head alone can't live by itself. The mouth alone, I mean, you know, you get the point. Everything has to be connected. And some of you are disconnected. And that's where a part of the problem is. Because it's not about just submission, submission to the Lord. You got to learn how to submit to one another. To work with leadership in the body. Let me give you this and then we got to go. 
Paul makes it clear that just because you have a position or a rank, that doesn't guarantee anything. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, know ye not that they which run in a race run all? Everybody that's running in a race, everybody's running. If you're in the race, you're all running. But only one receives the prize. So Paul is saying, run with the intent to win. Ah, God, I feel the Holy Ghost right there. Somebody declare, put it in the chat. I am a winner. I am a winner. And the verse 25 says, and every man that's striving for the mastery is temperate or balanced or moderate in all things. Now they, these athletes, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Paul is using the analogy of the Olympic games, the Roman games, the, the, the athletes that train, prepare themselves for competition. They know that competition is going to come. So they train in preparation and they do it to receive a crown that's going to fade away, a corruptible crown. But for the believer, our crown fadeth not away. It's incorruptible. Paul therefore says, I so run, not with uncertainty, not without purpose, not without focus, not without intent and direction. So fight I. I also fight, not as somebody that's shadow boxing. I'm not just swinging at open air. I'm swinging to make a hit. Glory to God. And he says, in connection with my athleticism is my sanctification. I keep under my body. This is the discipline. My athleticism is connect the, 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 the perfection of athleticism, the, the arete, the pinnacle of the athlete is seen in his discipline or her discipline. How many people, how many times have you seen gymnasts, um, tennis players, basketball players, football players, um, you know, all kinds of sports, um, um, skiing, ski jumping, um, NASCAR racing, all these kinds of sports. It's connected with discipline, disciplining the body to be able to operate at its peak under pressure. Come on, somebody. My God, my God, I can peak under pressure. P-E-A-K, I can peak under pressure. I'm not wimping out under pressure. The athletes prepare to be at their peak performance under pressure. When they're practicing, when they're doing scrimmages, that's just the dress rehearsal. But they are doing it with the intent to be champions. I keep under my body when it comes down to the Christian walk, Paul says. I bring my body under subjection. I keep, I keep it under control. Least that by any means, when I have preached, when I have prophesied, when I have exercised my spiritual gifts in the area of my divine calling, I myself should be a castaway. And why? Why would the athlete who has completed an event lose their prize because they cheated because they didn't follow the rules because they tried to cut corners. They tried to take the easy way to the championship spot. Paul said, I'm not going to be foolish and run this race. Like I'm trying to win and then act like a fool and just dis become disqualified because I did not apply supernatural discipline. Y'all know I love you. This is a journey to be continued. Trust God, believe in yourself, change. Don't accept the norm. Don't accept the status quo. God has given you the power. He's given you staying power, but you've got to make up your mind to do this. You've got to submit. You will not have all the answers to every trial you face, but if you submit to God, God will show you. There may be something you're trying to figure out right now, and you're not exactly sure which way to go about it. I've got good news for you. God knows. You don't need to know everything. You just need to know God. And as you know God, he'll make the way plain. It, it, it's, we got to pray. We got to pray. We got to pray. I, I just feel... 
the unction of the Holy Spirit, and that it's time to pray. Let's bow our heads for a minute. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you and we thank you for these precious souls that have heard your word tonight. We thank you, Lord, for staying power. We thank you for staying power, power to stay saved, power to stay with you, power to stay loyal to you, staying power, power to stay on the firing line, Power to stay in the spirit of love. Power to stay in the fellowship with the believers. Power to stay, staying power. I thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost in us, whereby we can submit ourselves unto you. Lord God, you have started a great work in us. And tonight we make sure we make it loud and clear that you've done it all. You started this thing. You began this in us. You did it for us and set it apart for set us apart for it before the foundation of the world. All we had to do is come and say yes. This offer of salvation is for the world and anyone that comes to you by faith in Christ with a yes in their spirit shall be saved. I thank you, Lord, that salvation is free. Jesus paid it all. It's free to us. Glory to God. I thank you that Jesus shed his blood for us many, many years ago. I thank you that Jesus took the nails in his hands and his feet. Jesus was nailed to the cross for our sins, and he would not come down from the cross to relieve himself. He would not come down from the cross to comfort himself. He committed to us to give himself for us. We thank you for all oh, what manner of love you have bestowed upon us that we should be called your sons and daughters. What manner of love did Christ display for us that he would lay down his life for us? We who were dead in trespasses and sins. We who were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We didn't have even an Abrahamic hope. Hallelujah. But Christ came for us that we might be redeemed from our sins, saved from our past, delivered from the powers of darkness, and translated into the kingdom of, of Jesus Christ. We bless you, Lord, and thank you tonight for this great grace exchange, how he took our sins, Christ took our sins, and gave us a seat at the table. Woo! A seat at the table table, the banquet table of God. Lord, I thank you that there is no condemnation on your children. We have yielded ourselves. And even if we mess up, we thank you that we know where to get up. We know how to get up. We can confess our sins and that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And the blood of Jesus still works. <laughs> thank you for the blood of Jesus. That still works. Somebody listening tonight, Lord, needs to know that there's a way out. Need to know that there's a way up. Need to know that there's a way to you. And that way is through Jesus. Someone needs to know that they don't have to stay in the corner and hide because of what they've done. Because such were some of us, murderers, robbers, adulterers, fornicators, idolaters, revilers, extortioners, whoremongers, drunkards, such were some of us, but thank you, Father, for the blood that Jesus shed. Thank you for cleansing us of our sins. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. Thank you for taking away a sin consciousness and helping us to have our spiritual eyes opened to be conscious of you working in us now, that our focus is no longer on our failing, but our focus is on your power at work in us. Thank you for the shifting of focus from flesh to the Father, from our sins to our Savior, Woo! from our burdens to our burden bearer. My God, we love you. And we pray, Lord God, that someone listening would be encouraged in their walk by faith. Someone listening will make a decision for salvation, full and free. Someone listening may come out to church even to be with us on Sunday for worship. 
and let us pray for them and pray with them. Coming to church with a mind to be baptized in Jesus' name. Lord, set the stage and we come against every hindrance, every obstacle, every distraction, because we're believing that we're going to see something happen powerfully this week. We declare it and we decree it now. And we declare that it shall be done, even according to your word. For this is the confidence that we have in you, that if we ask anything according to your will, that you hear us. And we know that if you hear us, we have the petition that we have desired of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, I want to thank God for you. I want to thank God for you being with us tonight. Um, if you see fit to bless the ministry of Beulah Tabernacle, we want to invite you to do so through our PayPal um, on our website. You do not have to have a PayPal account to use that option. You can make a love gift donation with your debit or credit card. You can also um, send us a love gift through Zelle, uh, Beulah Tab Rocks at AOL.com, um, or you can mail it in to Beulah Tabernacle P.O. Box 100860, Brooklyn, New York, 11210-0806. Would you sow a seed? Would you take a moment to sow a seed into the ministry and bless the work of God, knowing that what you do unto the Lord, what you give unto the Lord, he'll give you more to give. We thank God for you in advance. My brothers and sisters, thank you for supporting us. Thank you for praying for us. As we're praying for you, we believe that God is not through with you yet. And even as we come to the end of this, the Power 2 series, we know that the Power 2 is in the Holy Ghost. And may the, <laughs> or to the people, or to the people, Holy Ghost power to the people. Praise the name of God. And so, beloved, tonight we'll offer up this benediction in the name of the Lord. With our hands uplifted, without being angry, without being confused, now the peace of God that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Look forward to seeing you next time. Until we meet and until we greet, take the limits off God. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you again real soon. Have a good night. God bless. Love you much. <laughs>